I am from Michigan. I'm from right here in Michigan. The hand is Michigan. Michigan has the third most diverse cropping system in the United States after Florida and California. So we cover a lot of crops, but corn and soybean are the top two crops in Michigan. And yes, we do produce cars and there is Detroit, but that's a little bankrupt area down in the corner. So we don't pay much attention to that. So I was asked to talk about aphids and plant viruses. I did my degree in, in uh, Minnesota on potatoes up in the Red River Valley on, on plant viruses. And I don't really work on plant viruses much anymore, but when soybean aphid first came in, it did change a lot about what was happening with plant viruses in the Midwest. A little higher? Okay, Kelly's gonna adjust it. Good? I can speak louder. Okay. So a lot of plant viruses are transmitted by insects. And of the insects that transmit them, about 70% uh, or three, three quarters or so are transmitted by sucking insects that poke the little mouth parts into the plant. So not all viruses get transmitted by insects, but many do. And of the type of insects that do this, aphids are the, are the queens of, of this. And I'm going to give you a few reasons why that is. Why are aphids such spectacular virus vectors? And then in particular, let's talk about soybean aphid. So why are aphids such good virus vectors? These are actually aphids on uh, grape, grape aphids. So first of all, you've all dealt with soybean aphid long enough to know, and with many aphids, to know that they're parthenogenic. That's a fancy way of saying that during the summer they reproduce without mating. And all the aphids in the summer that you see are female. So if you were an aphid colony, if this was summer and you were an aphid colony, most of you would not be here. And Kelly and I and maybe five others, we would have had all the donuts to ourselves because none of you guys would be here. It's pretty much a girls' club. And you can see this aphid here. Her, this is a non-winged aphid. She's a baby-making machine. Her body is set up to just produce kids. That's her only uh, purpose. And they give live birth. So this is like when you watch the PBS channel and there's the zebra out on the plains and the the baby zebra pops out and it kind of shakes itself a little bit and then it's running around after like 15 minutes. That's kind of what an aphid does. I'm a nerd, I've watched aphids give birth, I'm sure Kelly has done so too. And the little baby aphid kind of comes out and its legs come out and soon enough it's crawling across that, that plant. So they're, they're born live during the summer and they're born ready to feed on your plant. And that aphid, this aphid that is coming out of, out of mom, is already pregnant. Inside of her, her embryos are already developing. That's called telescoping of generations. I've always called this the father's worst nightmare, that the, the baby is born pregnant. So the grandmothers have their daughters, and their daughters are already have the granddaughters inside of them. So the reproductive capacity here is huge. The whole colony is female, and everybody's born pregnant, and it's live birth, so they're all ready to feed. There's, there's no eggs at that point. Then there's another fancy thing about aphids called polymorphism, which means having many forms. And aphids have different body types. And you see two body types during the summer. There's the body type that's the egg-laying machine aphid. She will never have wings. She doesn't waste any energy producing wings, which are pretty expensive. You've got to have muscles and all that wing tissue. The non-winged aphids as adults are baby-making machines. But then the other form are these alate forms or winged forms. And that's when your host plant uh, gets very crowded, or conditions change, and these are the aphids that are gonna leave the sinking ship or move to a new plant. This happens to be a grain aphid, and their job is to fly away, and they don't produce as many young, but their job is to start a new colony someplace else. So your neighbor's field's infested, and then you get his, his aphids as they, as they fly. The other thing about aphids that you have to understand is aphids will key in on, on color, uh, especially if you're wearing a yellow shirt in the field, sometimes aphids will land on you and you'll see them kind of crawling around on, on people. And they, they do have some host cues that they cue in on, but once they land on a surface that's green or, or yellow, the way they detect their host plant is essentially by tasting. So they stick their little mouth part into that plant and use that as a way to say, is this soybean, is this grape, is this uh, wheat? That's how, or is it a t-shirt that's, that's, that's green? So if you shopped like an aphid, and let's say your wife tells you to go buy bread, you'd essentially walk into Kroger or wherever you shop, and you'd just taste along the way until something tasted like bread, and you'd buy that. So in the process, 
aphids are sticking their little mouth part where they shouldn't a lot of times and into host plants that they would not normally feed on. And the other thing about aphids is they have very delicate mouth parts. Now this past year, we dealt with spider mites. Spider mites are kind of brutal plant feeders. They just sort of jab their mouth part into the plant. They don't care if they ruin a plant cell. But aphids are much more delicate. They're more female. They're much more delicate. And when that aphid feeds, she does not want the plant to know that she's there. And the way that she does that, I will show you. This is a, an electron micrograph picture of an aphid that I took back in graduate school. It's lasted me a long time. Here's its eye. Here are the antenna, the legs. This is the big sucking bulb on the front of her head where her muscles are, are sucking plant sap up. And then this kind of not very nice looking structure here, you can imagine, that is the sheath of the mouth part. And the mouth part itself is just this little tiny little slim uh, line that is coming out. It's very, very delicate. This big structure doesn't penetrate the plant, just this little uh, tiny thread-like part. And when an aphid feeds, it will go in and it tries to go around and between plant cells, not through them, because if it goes through them, the plant could have a, a wound, wound response, uh, it will know it's being attacked. So the aphid goes around in between and then plugs into the phloem tissue and feeds, and then she will go back out when she pulls out. And she will leave a little tube that, that, that she has uh, emitted that will allow her to, to uh, feed. And this is really important for plant virus transmission. This is one of the main reasons that insects are great at transmitting plant viruses. Because most of the time, plant viruses have to go from living tissue into living tissue. They can't just hang out in the atmosphere or be on the, on the top of the leaf. They need to be poked into good living tissue in order to survive. And aphids, with their delicate feeding and not producing a wound response, typically, allow a virus to then penetrate into, into living tissue. So because of that lack of wound response, a, uh, plants typically can support a lot of aphids. They can support a good number before, as long as there's roots that are supplying water to that plant, a lot of plants can handle a lot of aphids. When you get to this amount, this is actually a, a plant coming out of the ground in Michigan. This is the aphid number that was on that plant in 2007. There were over 250 on those little uh, plants. And the, actually, the plants look pretty green and kind of happy in a way, despite having all these aphids on them. So plants can support a lot of aphids because of that lack of, of uh, wounding. So just a summary, why are aphids you know, the best virus vectors that we have out there? They have that life history where they, they uh, move around a lot. They can move in the landscape. They have their baby-making machines that produce a lot of them, as well as the uh, morph that can fly. They sap sample, so they're sticking their mouth parts into a lot of places where they shouldn't, which allows them to be exposed to a lot of different viruses. And then uh, there's huge numbers of them. So one of the most important viruses that we have, the one of the most important type, types of viruses are non-persistent viruses. And they're called non-persistent because they don't persist very long in, in the vector. And they're acquired and transmitted in seconds. Literally, let's say I'm an aphid, I come up, this is a big infected plant, I probe my mouth part in, I sap sample just a little bit, suck a little sap in, and I think, this isn't soybean, this is potato and I move to another plant, and another plant, and finally I get to my host plant. Those, those, those viruses are acquired very quickly, but by the same token, they're put back into the plant very quickly. They're flushed back into the plant very quickly. So they're acquired and transmitted in seconds, maybe a few minutes. And it favors insect species that visit a crop, but don't stay to feed really long. It favors, for example, uh, Soybean mosaic virus, for, for instance, in soybean, has over 50 different types of aphids that transmit it. And soybean aphid is among them, but not necessarily the most important one. Because soybean aphid, when it finds soybean, settles down and starts to feed and it doesn't move around. If a grain aphid comes into soybean, though, or a potato aphid, or a corn aphid, and starts poking its mouth part into soybean, it's going to move, 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 and it's not satisfied. It's not going to settle down. And in the process, 
it can acquire that virus in its mouth part, kind of contaminating its mouth part, and then keep moving and moving and moving and move that virus to, to the next plant. So these non-persistent viruses are very commonly spread by aphids. Uh, if you grow potatoes around here, you know potato virus Y is one of them. Uh, there's some bean viruses. There's a lot of different non-persistent viruses, and many of them are transmitted by aphids, and often the aphid that's not in the crop of interest. The other thing, because these are spread so quickly, and they're picked up and spread so, so uh, fast, insecticides do nothing as far as stopping the spread of these viruses. If the aphid lands, even if there's insecticide residue there, they already poke their mouth part in, it takes seconds to transmit that, that virus, and they don't stick around long enough to be, to be killed. So when you look at an aphid, when I look at an aphid, I mean, I think aphids are cute, but I'm a little weird, but I also view them, they're dirty little hypodermic needles. That's what they are. It's like the intravenous drug user, you know, passing the needle to his friend in the, in the back alleyway and they, they are, can spread hepatitis or AIDS or whatever. This is the same thing with an aphid. It's a dirty hypodermic needle mouth part going from plant to plant to plant, potentially picking up viruses and transmitting them to healthy plants. So what about soybean aphid? Well, we've all seen soybean aphid. We uh, first found soybean aphid in 2000. Uh, it was described that the first field that I saw, I, I went to an extension, I, there was a note like le late July and, uh, from Wisconsin and it said, is anyone seeing aphids on soybean? And I sent a message to my extension agents and sure enough one said, oh, I think I have them. And I went to his extension meeting and he describes me as dancing around the bucket of plants because I was so excited because I think aphids are very, very cool. And we'd always wondered, why didn't we have soybean aphid in the US? We've had soybean for many, many years, uh, but we never got soybean aphid until 2000. 2000 was a big year in Michigan. 2001 was a bigger year. That was our really first big outbreak year. And 2003, and especially 2005, that was the biggest year that we ever had. In 2007, we had an outbreak that started and then it stopped. It just stopped in its tracks. We had a lot of biological control come in, and we haven't had an aphid outbreak since. I don't know, Kelly, uh, you, you guys in the, in the western area, I know in Minnesota, have had uh, a, a bit more. But in Michigan, I'd like to say I solved the problem, but 2005 was our last big year. And in Asia, soybean aphid is a big transmitter of a lot of non-persistent viruses. Uh, and in many U.S. crops, I've listed some of the viruses here that we know that it can transmit. One is potato virus Y to the north of you in North Dakota. They've had huge outbreaks of potato virus Y in the seed potato production. Uh, there's zucchini yellows, watermelon mosaic, cucumber mosaic. There's lots of different uh, viruses that you, that you may not have a lot of... Uh, interest in here because you're mostly growing corn and soybean and wheat, but if you were in a vegetable production area like I'm in, these are of really high concern. And so the initial question for the U.S. when soybean aphid came in, especially 2001 and 2003, was is this a, a, a new vector in, in the U.S.? So this is a population, this is my, uh, my number of soybean aphids uh, per plant at a research station that's in Saginaw, Michigan. It's in our thumb of Michigan up in this area. This is a heavy uh, corn and soybean production region. It looks a lot like the Red River Valley. And uh, this is in 2005. And you can see I've got this huge peak of aphids in late July into August. And this was pretty typical in our initial outbreak years. And I'm showing you the average number of aphids per plant. And my average was almost 17,000. I counted those aphids because it's a very zen thing to do to count aphids with a little clicker. And I wanted to, ch my, my students didn't want to count those plots. They like to count the insecticide sprayed plots. So I would volunteer to count the control plots. Uh, our highest number of aphids per plant was 32,000. I counted that too. And those were since called Defonso numbers after that by some of the people. But it was very useful that we sat and counted 17,000 aphids per, per, per plant, because I'm gonna show you how did that uh, how does that relate to virus spread? So this is kind of what we were seeing on the plants, what you've probably seen in outbreak years. 
huge number of, of aphids per plant. When you see aphids on stems and pods, you know it's bad. They'll stay on, they go on the leaves first, and then they move to stems and pods. And most of these aphids, by the early part of August, uh, they weren't the, the non-winged baby-making machine aphids. They were going to be winged aphids. And the reason we can tell that is, if you look here, hopefully that's appearing, these are little shoulder pads. This is a, an aphid nymph that's late stage, and in her next molt, she's going to have wings. So you can tell by these little shoulder pads here, that's the wing muscle that is not quite the, that wing structure that's about to be developed. So in this population, we actually sat down in August and tried to figure out how many, uh, how many aphids per plant are we actually producing here. So that was my plant population. I knew what my plant population was in our, in our big, and this was, this was a huge field. I had an average of 17,000 aphids per plant, and I sampled them to see what percentage of those 17,000 were winged, and it was about 90%. The, Plants were covered with aphids. These aphids were ready to leave and go someplace else. And if you multiply this out, 17,000, 90% of 17,000 times 160,000, it was whatever that number is, it's more than billions. It's a lot of aphids. That was my winged number of aphids, number of winged aphids generated per acre in just this one field in Michigan in that, in that year. And the inter this was actually in 2001 when I, when I did this. So then uh, it, says, it says 2005, but it was 2001. So what actually happened was that next week, and you may, you were probably too far west to know this, but there was a mass aphid movement east, and the Toronto Blue Jays game was postponed for a bit because there were aphids flying around people's heads as they were trying to pitch and catch. Uh, there were aphids that were reported in the downtown part of Detroit. I figured it was the closest they'd come to agriculture. I thought that was a good thing, that there was like aphids flying around people in Detroit. Uh, they were found all across Canada, and we actually thought that this was when Canada got infested, and it was by me generating these huge numbers of aphids in Michigan per plant, these winged aphids. And as these winged aphids moved, they didn't just go immediately to another soybean field. They went around and found green and yellow things, and they poked their little mouth parts in there, whether it was a plant or a, a crop plant or a weed, and, it, and potentially spreading viruses uh, across that entire area. So we can tell what was going on uh, when aphids are, are flying by this suction trap network. And you actually have a trap that's around here somewhere, right? I don't know it's on campus or at a, at a farm. But back in 2005, this is what the trapping uh, uh, thing looked look like. Here are some traps in Michigan. Uh, here's the thumb of Michigan where that one farm was at. This is where East Lansing is. And in these traps, I'm just going to show you the maps uh, for the aphid flight during the high point of the season. So this is what one of these traps look like. Uh, Kelly's trap probably looks similar. They're catching aphids from 20 or 30 feet in the air. When aphids uh, first get their wings, they're kind of programmed to move. They don't want to fly to the next plant, because that's probably a crummy plant too. They're programmed to take off, fly for a certain period of time up high, and then land to increase the possibility that they move to someplace better. So this trap is is sucking in aphids that are on their, their flight to go someplace else. Sometimes it sucks in a bird, sometimes it sucks in some wasps or something, but usually it's just getting aphids and other small insects, and we can change that every week. And then those trap catches were sent to a fellow at University of Illinois who would pull out the aphids and identify them. So there's a, this trap in Michigan, this one right here, is actually the most diverse trap on the, on the network, historically. It has the most number of species. But in 2005, this was July 1st, when the uh, aphids were just beginning to increase. And when you see a dot, if it's white, it's just barely catching. But when we start to get into these oranges and reds, if you're colorblind, maybe it's dark gray, uh, you'll see that those, that's going to be thousands of winged soybean aphids caught in these traps. So by July 15th, Michigan's coming up into these really heavy numbers. There was uh, July, the end, the end of July. Into August, uh, 
the guy actually called me that does this and he says, are you intentionally dumping soybean aphids into your trap? What are, how are you, they've never seen such high numbers. These traps were catching almost 5,000 aphids in a week in, in this little jar, winged soybean aphids flying around through Michigan. And then there's the middle of August. And then the flight stopped. So we have these really heavy peak flights. And I'm in Michigan where I have a lot of vegetable production in this area here especially. Also Wisconsin, Minnesota, and you may even have some uh, across the border here. So for people that are doing vegetables at this time frame, this many winged aphids with dirty little hypodermic needles flying through the atmosphere, that was really bad news. Here's a picture uh, in July 25th in, in one of my plots. This was a, a sprayed plot. Uh, this is just uh, soybean trifoliate, and you don't have to, all the little black things on the leaf, those are winged aphids. Winged aphids have a real hard shell on their uh, thorax in, in order to have wings. So here's a big, fat, juicy mom aphid, but all these little black ones, these are the alates, and these had landed, uh, or, or been, uh, these had actually landed from the night before because this was a, was a sprayed plot. So I had an average of 40 winged aphids per leaf that were landing. My high was 166 on the top of this plant. And this was like morning. And by late afternoon, these had taken off again. You could actually see that there were aphids landing in soybean. And, and they were soybean aphid, and they were leaving babies behind. And then they were taking off again. But if this had been a virus-infected plant, these aphids would have picked up the virus and then move to another plant, or potentially if this had been another crop, they would have landed on cucumbers or zucchini or potato and, and moved viruses as well. So we, can, uh, we often can capture aphids in other crops. These are pictures of when I worked up in North Dakota on, on uh, potato production. We used to capture aphids using uh, green or yellow uh, traps. It's very commonly done. And we were getting in our, in our vegetable production area, hundreds of soybean aphids landing in vegetable fields uh, in a given day. So here's an example in 2005, uh, after our really big flights, I work on dry beans as well as soybeans. And in dry beans, we do have some, uh, some cultivars that are susceptible to certain viruses. And one of them is bean common mosaic virus. And this is Tebow dry bean, it's an older dry, uh, dry bean uh, variety, and it's very susceptible to this virus. So if you look at the close-up here, every single plant in this field was infected with virus uh, by August. It had started out completely clean, except for maybe a few plants that had come up with the virus in the, in the seed. We had that huge, huge aphid flight that came through, thousands of aphids being caught in traps, probably millions of aphids flying around. And from that one center point, Aphids had then picked up that virus and spread it. And when I looked at this field, I could not find a single plant that was not infected with this virus. And that had occurred probably within about a, about a month. Now, other dry beans were not so infected. But in this area, anybody that planted this particular uh, dry bean cultivar uh, had very heavy yield loss. Here's another example. This is at the end of that year. These are the Halloween pumpkins in front of my local Kroger store. And I had observed that they were kind of knobbly looking, which you may, you know, maybe they could sell them for more money and call them like a special variety, but they weren't. These are virus infected. These probably had zu uh, zucchini yellows or watermelon mosaic virus, and they kind of had that knobbly little look. So I hopped out of my car, I planned it so no one would see me, and I took a picture and then I hopped back in my car so they wouldn't question what I was doing. And when you cut into these, people reported, and you made your little jack o' lantern, they just sort of, uh, went to pot within, uh, within days. They, they didn't last for a very long time, so they were very, very poor quality. So you can see this one looks okay, but this one's probably infected. So we did have vegetable losses in that year during really heavy soybean aphid flights. So we know in the laboratory that soybean aphids can, uh, we've now since tested them, they spread, again, potato virus Y and potato for your uh, people in Minnesota and North Dakota, 
uh, things in cucumber, squash, and then in dry beans, one of, one, one of my crops. And depending on how many, so, so what you typically do for these tests, you have an infected plant, you take a little brush, you starve your aphids for an hour or so, you put them on the plant, you leave them for about a minute, and then you move them very carefully and leave them for a few minutes, and that's enough to spread the virus. So for something like, you know, you put 40 of them or five or 10 of them, you can get almost 100% transmission of some of these viruses. So non-persistent viruses, these mosaic viruses typically, are usually spread by aphids that do not colonize the crop. So dry beans are not a host plant for soybean aphid. The reason why they were going along and landing in dry bean and they weren't happy and they kept moving and moving and moving throughout this dry bean field, they don't recognize it as a host. And that, those dry beans were wiped out by soybean aphid from soybean, essentially. So these non-persistent viruses are most efficiently spread by insects that don't colonize your, uh, your crop. And in our outbreak years, we get millions and bazillions of soybean aphids flying around out there, dirty hypodermic needles moving across the landscape. And if you think about it, there's few other crops. When we didn't have an aphid in soybean, we have millions of acres of soybean. The reason why soybean aphid is so bad, it's just there's so many of them, is there's millions and billions of acres of soybean. And we never had an aphid like that before. You know, there might be aphids produced on uh, trees, but there's not that many of them. Even in uh, wheat, you know, you only have so, so many acres of, of wheat in, as, we, as we move into this area or into the east. But if you look at soybean, there's millions of acres of soybean. And that potential to develop little dirty hypodermic needles is just huge. So when you have an aphid outbreak and they move across the landscape, it's bad news for any other crop that's worried about viruses. And of course, they land and they sap sample and they spread these viruses very, very rapidly. Now, you're always going to have aphids. I mean, there's aphids all over the place. There's dirty little hypodermic needles everywhere. And we have uh, aphid-resistant beans that are uh, out. There's a, there's a, a, a few... Uh, Varieties, a few companies have aphid resistant beans. In the next few years, you're going to see more aphid genes stacked or pyramided together to produce better aphid resistant uh, lines. And instead of trying to manage the aphid, even if we have aphid resistant beans, we still have a lot of aphids out there. Aphids on corn, we'll still have aphids on, on beans, we have aphids on wheat. What we typically tell people is, you have to start with clean seed and you have to manage the inoculum. If the virus isn't there, it doesn't matter if a million aphids land on your crop. You need to get rid of the inoculum and use virus resistant varieties. So in many uh, crops like dry beans, uh, we typically use virus resistant varieties and we don't have much of a problem. So if you're mostly soybean growers, you're sitting here thinking, what do I care about pumpkins? I don't grow pumpkins, I don't grow potato, I don't grow any of these crops. But here's something to, to think about. We never had an aphid that lived on soybean in the US till, till the late 90s or 2000 when we found soybean aphid. We were living kind of a charmed life. There are several persistent viruses in Asia. One of them is called Indonesian soybean dwarf. That's a really long name. Another one is called soybean yellow mosaic. These are bad pictures because I've never seen them and I had to steal them off the internet. But these are persistently transmitted. Persistent viruses are different. They're closely associated with, their host, with, with the, the crop and the aphid that transmits them. And it takes hours to acquire the virus and hours sometimes to transmit the virus. And they stay within the aphid for a long period of time, usually its entire life. So these kind of viruses are vectored by aphids that live on the crop. So a persistent virus, if you grow potatoes, would be like potato leaf roll virus, which is spread by the aphids that live in potato. And they sit there and feed for days, and they acquire the virus. And then they crawl to the next plant, and they feed for days, and they transmit the virus. But they have to live there to do that. We don't have these two viruses in the, in the, in the United States because we never had anybody to transmit them. But we now, here's our virus. We now have a vector. We now have the soybean aphid in the United States that could potentially then, if this virus is introduced in some way on uh, plant material or in seed, uh, that could potentially be a problem. So we're now at risk of several 
potential new soybean viruses that we've never seen before from Asia uh, coming into the Midwest. So the previous speaker, or maybe two speakers ago, talked about being vigilant and going into your field and looking at things. And it's very important if you see something that doesn't look right in a, in a soybean field and you've never seen it before, it's worth pulling that plant. It's worth taking that, that sample in. Uh, one example I will give you in my last thing here is we have, I have a forest entomologist in Michigan. We have a lot of forests and a lot of invasive things that come into our forests. And our forest entomologist did a nice slide set a few years ago of everything that could potentially get, get to Michigan. And she showed pictures of this to all of the uh, like people that work in state parks and people like that. And the next summer, just a few months later, there was a guy peeing on a tree in a state park he had been trained by her, and as he gazed at the tree, he suddenly realized that what he was looking at was one of the insects that she had warned about and asked to be reported. So from that, that was the first report at that time of that insect being in Michigan because she had pre-trained them to look for some of these things. So if you're seeing some interesting viruses out there, if you see an insect that, that, you're, not, that you're not familiar with, please report that back to Kelly or your extension folks because I would expect in the next few years that we may see these viruses come into our production system.